Our last census in 2016 counted 23.4 million people living in Australia. What does the most common Australian look like? She's a 38-year-old married woman with two kids. She's living in a home with three bedrooms and two vehicles, and her weekly household income is about $1,400. She's likely to go to work in a car, along with 68.4% of us. Does that describe you? It probably doesn't. But don't worry, because no matter where you live, how much you earn, or how many babies you have, every one of us counts. I count because I need my community's voice to be heard. I count because I'm a part of the Australian community. I count because I have a two-year-old daughter and I need to work. Because I need up-to-date statistics to help grow my small business. Because I live in the regions where we need good infrastructure. Because I need my local footy club, got a fellow mateship and friendship at the club. August 10th is Census Day, when every person in Australia is counted by filling out a census form. Altogether, those forms are a snapshot of all Australians at once. And that helps us understand our country. How many people live here? How old are they? Their gender, whether they work or go to school, and the languages they speak. Governments, councils and community organisations use this data to plan for the future and determine where services are most needed. Just as important, Census also tells the story of how our country is changing. And it gives us some fun facts, if stats are your thing. Did you know there are almost 300 languages spoken in our homes, including Auslan, Australian Sign Language? Each census, no longer useful questions are deleted, and new ones, relevant to our ever-changing country, are added. A new question this year asks about service in the Defence Force. We actually don't know right now exactly how many veterans live in Australia. Many people leaving the Defence Force suffer both physical and mental health issues, as well as homelessness. The Bureau of Statistics hopes this new question will help organisations target their services and support, like that given to ex-veterans like James, who found the transition to civilian life a difficult one. Wings and wings, just so much water. People were torn from their chairs, they were sucked out of buses, they were thrown up second, third storey windows. It became apparent very quickly that we were headed into one of the most catastrophic natural disasters that any of us had ever seen. Uh, pretty much everyone in all of the houses on the beachfront has disappeared. I remember thinking at one point, this experience is going to change how I see the world. It's going to change me as a person. How am I going to do this? Can I do this? Am I strong enough to go into this situation and make this okay for myself and make it okay for my teammates and make it okay for the people that we were there for? Being in the Army was my dream job. I had a family of friends, mateship, where we could rely on each other to get the job done. When you leave, that identity is no longer there and you feel alone. I went to Banda Arche and within five weeks of coming home, I was discharged voluntarily. There was no follow-up. I was on my own for a couple of years before our, our unit sergeant actually called me. He said, are you okay? I said, not really. And at that point, I was at my lowest of low, suicidal, over drinking, having massive relationship trouble, struggling to stay afloat financially, hitting absolute rock bottom, struggling with post-traumatic stress. I came to Warrnambool for a mental health break. I was completely on my own. I didn't know a single veteran in town. The RSL Active Program caught my attention because it was about coming together, doing health and wellbeing activities, and I realised I needed to work on my health and wellbeing. So I joined the group, and over the last three years, slowly but surely, we've built it up into a group of 200 contemporary veterans and their families. I've come over, yes, yeah, two hours from my sub-branch at Haywood, over here, to support um, RSL Active. Veterans obviously connect really well, um, and having a group of us together um, really shows support for each other, and uh, that community involvement um, also draws it, and makes it a better experience for everybody. 40 seconds to go. I come down here for a few reasons. One is to join the younger vets. 
uh, I'm an older vet. The other is that this is the best thing I can do to help myself uh, to win out over a battle with cancer. Before I got into this group, I didn't realise there were anywhere near this many contemporary veterans living around Warrnambool. Over recent times, the Defence Force and Department of Veterans Affairs have done a lot of work to collaborate on how to help people transition from military life to civilian life, which is great, because I didn't get that experience when I left the Defence Force. Now that I'm a community and peer advisor for Open Arms in Warrnambool, I've been able to reach out across the southwest region and we're finding veterans far and wide in very remote regional towns where there are absolutely no services except for the RSL for veterans and their families. There's a big um, issue with homelessness and uh, mental health issues with veterans in communities and they feel very isolated and to be able to reach out and, and potentially do preventative work with them and get them involved and um, stop those issues from occurring down the track is really important. Being able to tick the box on the census and say, I served in the Defence Force, is a moment to be proud of. It's something that anybody that served one single day can tick that box for, and you should go ahead and tick it. And then the services that you need for your family and yourself will come out of the metro areas into the regional areas and support you to transition from military to civilian life. And that will make all the difference and it will save lives. Australia has an ageing population. At least one in six of us are over 65, up from one in seven in 2011, and only one in 25 in 1911. Humans are social creatures. We thrive on connection with others. But as we age, that connection can sometimes be lost, leading to isolation and loneliness. The city of Burnside in Adelaide has found a way to combat isolation through its programs aimed at mature members of the community. You could say they're a pretty tight-knit group. I started with the knitting group about four years ago, and that was mainly because I couldn't play tennis anymore. We enjoy talking, we do knitting, and we are happy, and it's a lovely ladies, so it gives you happiness, you know. Yeah, and then you know, just that, waiting yeah, for winter to come. Knitting and cooking. <laughs> knitting and cooking. The census data is critically important for the city of Burnside, so we use the demographic data to ensure that we tailor our service provision directly to the needs of our community. The knitting group came about because we'd identified that there was a growing group of our older ladies who were becoming socially isolated. And what we tapped into was one of their loves, and that's knitting. They all love to knit. So the team pulled together a social group based around knitting. And I suppose if you, if you use the light blue, it brings it up a little bit. bit. Yeah. Oh, because it's female interaction, which I really enjoy. Oh, I enjoy knitting, but I'm not as good as most of the ladies, but... One of the programs we're providing is uh, our shed, which is an amazing program, loosely based on historically the men's shed concept. It now provides men's services, women's services and group sessions. Wow, Lee, that is a beauty. We're going to enter it in the Melbourne Cup. <laughs> <laughs> They're all uh, fun activities, but the main <laughs> emphasis is on social interaction to look after our older residents' social and mental well-being. Thank you. Oh, yes, I've made a lot of friends in this group. I think it's very important, and to look after the elderly, especially these years that we've been gone through, and what's still to come, of course, is very important, look after the elderly. <laughs> Population headcounts date back to the musters of the late 18th century, where the community gathered together to be counted to help match food and supplies to the people needing them. 
but the first census in Australia, as we now know them, was held in New South Wales in 1828. Each of the colonies conducted its own census until 1886. Not that everyone was counted. Some Indigenous Australians living on reserves were counted in early censuses, but that changed when, at Federation in 1901, the new national constitution ruled Aboriginal natives shall not be counted. That appalling law took more than 65 years to rectify. For 1911's census, around 7,300 people collected 4 million census cards from across the nation, on foot, bicycle and horseback. 3,600,051. Those 4 million cards were then counted by hand. Uh, sorry, mate, I think you've missed one there. One, two... Back then, censuses were supposed to be held every 10 years, but a few big events got in the way. The 1931 census was pushed back due to the Great Depression. 1941 was delayed due to World War II. The census isn't just about urban planning. Early 20th century counts contributed to a medical breakthrough, helping find the link between infectious disease rubella and birth defects. In 1961, the census went high-tech. A new collecting machine was built to tabulate the data. A mechanical computer so big, it couldn't fit through the census office doors. They had to cut a hole in the wall just to get it in the building. That big boy didn't last long, though. Five years later, it was replaced by electronic computers. In 1971, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders had finally been acknowledged as Australians. Census collectors started travelling to remote communities so that everyone could be counted. Fast forward a few decades and in 2001, people were asked permission to let the ABS keep their details, including their name, to be released to future researchers 99 years later. And so began the census time capsule project. The first capsule opening will be on the 7th of August in the year 2100. Save the date. Yeah! From then, the census leapt onto the digital highway. Paper forms are so last century. In 2006, for the first time, you could do the census online. And in that year, 10% of households chose to do so. That grew to a third of us in 2011. And in 2016, when the digital became the default, almost 60% did so. Not without pain, though. On census night, the ABS website crashed as thousands were trying to do their civic duty. With Australians being denied service, the Bureau eventually shut the website down to prevent information being stolen. And that brings us to today. To avoid the problems of five years ago, we now don't all have to do the census at once. For the first time, there's a window to complete it. Fill it out whenever suits you. And Census 2021 should be very illuminating, a snapshot of the way we live and work amidst a global pandemic. So that's the history of the Census in less than four minutes. But the results from this year's count won't be available that quickly. You'll have to hold your horses until mid-2022. Australia is a migrant nation, increasingly so, with a rich mix of backgrounds and heritage. In 2016, more than a quarter of our population was born overseas, and we know that number is growing. England remains the most common overseas birthplace, but people born in China are a growing share, now 8.3% of all migrants. 7.4% of migrants were born in India. According to our last census, one-fifth of Australians spoke a language other than English at home. The most common language was Mandarin. 2.5% of us spoke it at home in 2016, up from 1.6% in 2011. Language barriers can make it harder for people from migrant backgrounds to connect with others in the community. One not-for-profit in South Australia has found a way to bring young people from migrant and refugee backgrounds together. They found the universal language Football. I'm Zara and I'm 21 years old, originally from Afghanistan. When I joined Bangkoju team, 
I didn't know anyone. And I, of course, I didn't have any friends. But here I have a lot of friends. We are all friendly. Girls and women from different ages, different backgrounds, they can calm down and play as a team. And we play games, we share experiences, we share food, we play together and it's fun. They love it. Culture is an organization that works in the community. Um, we're a relatively young organization that started in 2017. And we began as a charity providing uh, programs for youth, particularly youth from cold backgrounds, so that's culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, as well as migrant and refugee backgrounds, to build connections through football. My name is Raya. I'm 21 years old. I was born in Somalia and I've been in Australia for seven years. The friends I met here is like really good friend, like good vibes. Even like after soccer, we hang out together. I make friends, true friends, friends, friends. <laughs> the biggest challenges for migrants and refugees vary. But particularly for young people, it's adjusting to the environment, particularly at schools. Um, and especially when uh, language is a big barrier. We found in our data and our research that sport plays a very important element in that transition because it's not as heavily reliant on language skills. And that gives an opportunity for those migrants and refugees to be better incorporated within the community. The census has really informed the need for our programs in terms of the community profiles for the specific areas that we work in and why the interventions that we're using through sport um, are needed for those specific communities. And the approach that we take at One Culture Football is that prevention is better than cure. So the programs that we use and are informed by the census data really provide opportunities for those young people to pursue pathways that are meaningful in the long term, rather than taking pathways that might lead them into crime or um, even worse. We found that the participation in sport and that inclusion really fosters connections with the people and it's been very helpful in the way in which they interact with the rest of society and how they transition from adolescence into adulthood. My life in Somalia was different to this life because all I used to do was stay home, help mom, cook, just like supporting and everything. But when I came here, I had the opportunity to study, also to find friends, and finding friends got me here into one culture now, playing soccer. I used to be like more shy than I am now. Now I'm getting better, and also it also improved my English too. And the communication and everything, yeah. We play together, we, we score together, we win together, we lose together. So I think that's the most important thing that we do. That's the aim of One Culture Football is to empower people of all um, cultures, backgrounds and abilities, forging community connections through the world game. Football, the real football that is. <laughs>We fill out the census in the place we spend the night on August 10th. For most of us, that's our home. But everyone counts, including some of our most vulnerable, the homeless. Whether they're sleeping rough, living in cars, couch surfing or in temporary accommodation. Last census, more than 116,000 people told the Bureau they were homeless, a rise of almost 30% from 2006. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were 3% of the population, but accounted for 20% of people experiencing homelessness. Orange Sky Australia helps people without a home with their free laundry facilities, warm showers and a friendly person to chat to. And where do they send their trucks? The census helps them decide. What started as a, a weekend project in a garage with two best friends, now Orange Guy is much more than, than Nick and Lucas. Both Lucas and I are incredibly excited to continue expanding services to reach every one of those 105,000 Australians homeless tonight. We can restore respect, raise health standards, and be a catalyst for conversation. 
Orange Sky started with our first van, Sudsy, in Brisbane and now has 33 vans in operation around Australia and New Zealand and currently operates three assets in remote Indigenous communities. Overcrowding in a lot of communities leads to um, infections and those infections lead to things like rheumatic heart disease. So one of our aims is to raise health standards but also to positively connect the community through a really simple formula of providing safe hot showers, clean clothes through laundry services, but most importantly, orange chairs for people to sit down and connect on. On this island, you'll see a lot of couch surfing. You'll see folk who have come from homelessness on the mainland come here and, you know, find a, a safety net. Your broken mach washing machines have occurred not because, um, you know, it was a bad brand, but because, oh, yeah, come on, do your washing, you know, and it's like, instead of that washing machine being for one family, it's for four or five families, you know, and... The census data and information is so crucial to what we do at Orange Sky. It really helps to guide us and, and shape where the next vans and where the next rollouts are going to happen, what communities really need that support. So the more um, data and information that we have, the better informed we are, um, the better support we can provide to people who are doing it tough in our community. Ebenezer, who we've employed, it's been great to see him um, really engage, but also, in particular, his He's a key leader, and so he influences um, a number of other men folk around the place. This area was a bit bushy, so um, me and Richard decided to come around and give it a mow and clean it up a bit. We also run a, a small business, which is a um, um, lawn ma maintenance, and so some of the folk that we've engaged through Orange Sky then flowed over into, into that. And that's because of the the conversations that we've had around the van. <laughs> there's lots of numbers at, at Orange Sky, and there's lots of numbers in the world, and that data's great, but what we also know is that behind every number is a human and a story, and as humans, we're incredibly uh, complex and diverse, and sometimes a number doesn't reflect uh, the true significance of every person's story behind that number. For me, what it comes down to is being non-judgmental, is having the conversation and, and really um, just, um, yeah, being really supportive of, of everyone in our communities, and that um, how, what's going to make Australia a better place. You know, you're helping someone who doesn't have a washing machine or a dryer. It's really good. I look forward to getting up every morning, coming to work. It's a human need, and we all need to actually feel good about ourselves. Fifty years ago, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were finally included in the census, thanks to the 1967 referendum. Last census night, almost 650,000 people identified as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, up from 116,000 in 1971. The Indigenous population of South East Queensland is one of the largest and fastest growing in the nation. And to ensure that these communities get the support they need, the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health is increasing its health services, especially for young mothers. So the health gap that exists for our community, the First Nations community, sees that our families will die 10 years earlier than anyone else. This for me is extremely confronting especially as I sit amongst my community who experience chronic disease. I now have the opportunity here with the Birthing in Our Community program to completely change that, to focus on prevention and to help our families carry their baby for as long as they possibly can so that child can be strong and healthy and enter the world like everybody else and have the same health equity that any other person has the human right to, to access, to have, to hold. When you go mainstream, it's like there's a long waiting list for mothers. Wait and wait and wait. But these guys here, you know, um, especially being an Indigenous clinic, it's just they just get things going straight away. The bio program is so important to our women in the community, um, particularly if they're birthing within an institutional setting. Um, you know, the hospitals aren't, you know, really seen as a place, a safe space. So the hub here is. Uh, you know, a safe space for our women to come and have their care and 
really have that family feel. Yeah, the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health is a, a regional health organisation. It's our vision at IUI is uh, strong, vibrant, healthy individuals, families and communities. Census data has been an important part of the growth and journey of IUI really did tell the story and provide us the insight and understanding that there was a huge job to be done in terms of meeting the needs of our people. Uh, data generally has been a, a huge pillar and foundation upon the work of, of the network um, and all of our member services. It's incredibly powerful to um, build mum's capacity to be the best parent she can be. So here at the Hub, we not only have our midwives and our incredible family support workers, but we also offer transport. If our mums didn't have access to transport, they would find it difficult getting to the appointments. And those appointments are very important for them, for the milestones throughout their pregnancies. And not only for the baby, but for their mums. I really was um, somebody who just want like a house mouse. I'd just stay in the house and just didn't want to associate with anybody. But now being here, I'm very social, um, out of my shell. Thanks to the Birthing Now Community Program, one of the great outcomes has been that we have seen a 50% drop in preterm birth weights. What that means is, is that our families are holding their babies longer um, and birthing babies closer to the 40 week mark. This means that baby is born stronger and therefore um, less likely to experience chronic disease later in life. Definitely when you're working with, I guess, your own people, it's just like home, I guess. You're like family helping family, so, yeah. We are here, we are strong, and it is about seeing the resilience that sits within and working to that strength. On the topic of babies, in 2016 we welcomed 311,104 newborn bubs into this country. That's almost twice as many babies as were born in the 1946 baby boom. And in the census, everyone counts, even if they're just one day old. You might just need to give them a hand with the paperwork. Because in August 2016, thousands of babies were missing. The undercount for zero to four-year-olds was 5.1%. That's one in 20 kids. Understandably, some of those parents may have had quite a bit on their plate, especially if they're still in a hospital. It's easy for parents to forget sometimes, so we just give them a helping hand. Cute Babies is the perfect way to end this journey into the census and why we count. To help paint a picture of who we are as a nation, how to build a better future for all Australians, and hopefully the census affects how governments spend our hard-earned taxes for the next generation. And with that in mind, I'll leave you with a message from that generation with their ideas on how they'd improve Australian lives. If I had a million dollars, what would I buy? Beds. Or cars. Clothes. And showers. Oh, well, I'm out of ideas. Or oh, help people to get homes, buy new schools, I think. And after I give them everything they need, I might get them a pet or something. Uh, maybe a spiny leaf insect or a snake or a turtle or a dog or maybe a cat. And food. That's what I would spend it on. Lots and lots of food. Thank you.